everybody? Wow. Hello. Hi. I could stand back here and talk. Thank you for joining us at the Biodiversity Conference. Hope you guys are all having a good time. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Terry Henkel. He's our resident rock star mycologist. He's the drummer for Triple Junction and uh, leads a bunch of exciting expeditions down to the Guyana Shield. Um, received his PhD from Duke and he's been at HSU for 10 years now where his work has published nearly uh, 60 peer-reviewed articles and he includes a lot of his students in that work. So with no further ado, Dr. Henkel. Check, one, two. He said I was in a band, right? A um, couple quick stories. Uh, Dr. Hayes said telling a story, and I don't know if mine will be good or not, is an important way to get across to people. First one's about Bobby. I spent almost the entire summer doing field work down in the tropics, and I put one of those messages on my email that says, I'm gone, I'm off the grid, you can't get a hold of me, and I'll be back on a certain date. You get back here in the summer, it's pretty quiet at Humboldt State, not too many people around. I'm actually in my lab, bam, 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 on the door I'm going, who's trying to find me now? It's like July 17th or something. And it was Bobby, because he wanted to make sure that he could talk me into being on the bill here, which it didn't, wasn't hard for him to do, but he found me. The other little, it's kind of a hypothetical story is this. Bobby mentioned something about music. This scenario that I'm in right now is sort of like you're in a local band and there's a big show coming to town and they want to book the local band to like open up for the main act and then you get the flyer out for the bill and you realize that the big act is coming on right before you do. So <laughs> I'm viewing Dr. Hayes sort of like James Brown came to town and I was supposed to open for him but I'm actually following that act <laughs> which if if you're in the music business, you know that's not a situation you like to be in. But nonetheless, we'll give it a shot. So I'm going to talk today about this kind of general title that doesn't really uh, say anything specifically, but aspects of our work with fungi and fungal biodiversity involving both tropical regions of the world and temperate regions, um, which we are in here. Stay by the podium, okay. I'm used to having a wireless headset mic, you know, so I can move around. Yeah. So there's one basic question, and I'm basically going to try to speak from the perspective of what we've learned from research activities that myself and my lab group and collaborators have done uh, in these two radically different parts of the world, the North Temperate Zone and down in the Neotropics, on how can fungi potentially or can we, how can they shape the structure and fun function of forest ecosystems? We all may have kind of a general idea that fungi, we may have a general idea what they are. They're out there in the ecosystem. They are a part of biodiversity and everything in nature has some kind of effect on everything else in ecological interactions. So they must be doing something, but really our understanding of some, some of the, what appear to be the critical functions of fungi inside of ecosystems and affecting how plants compete with each other and ultimately affect the structure and composition of forested ecosystems is an area that we're still, start, still beginning to get a handle on. So to do this, I'm going to address some general stuff about fungal organisms first, then take a look at the tropical story I'd like to tell, and then finish up with a local temperate story along these lines. So you see two stars there. One of them's in Humboldt County, and one's down in some little country there in South America called Guyana. There's a canopy of coniferous forest up to the left and a canopy of uh, rainforest, tropical rainforest, down in Guyana. And there's a couple mushroom fruiting bodies here. On my left, and your left also, is a forest pathogenic fungus, Pseudoinonotus striatus, that is now known to be, based on the, the studies of one of my graduate students that recently finished, a very important ecosystem shaper in our coniferous forests of the north coast ranges up here. On the right, you see a chanterelle. 
It's a chanterelle from the tropics, Cantharella skyanensis, which is an ectomycorrhizal fungus. Not a pathogen, but a mutualist that interacts with the plants in a very intimate way on its root systems to share nutrients and provide mutual benefits both ways. So these kinds of interactions of fungi, whether they're pathogens or parasites on the plant, a living plant, or uh, whether they're in a mutualistic situation, have the capacity to affect the ecosystem through space and time in a number of ways that I'm going to try to show. So there are a number of students that are in my classes now or have been here, and some of these slides like this one they've already seen a million times. Fungi are heterotrophic. Hetero means other, and trophic means something about feeding or resource gathering. So they are other feeding. We are other feeding also. We don't go out in the sun and actually photosynthesize. You may go sit in the sun to enjoy it and so forth, but you're not photosynthesizing and fixing your own carbon and feeding in the way that plants and algae and some other organisms do. Fungi are a bit like humans in that respect, that they have to gain their food from already fixed carbon sources, living or dead bodies of other organisms. Within that context, most fungi are saprotrophic, which means simply that they feed on non-living organic matter and primarily non-living plant matter. But many of them are mutualist or parasites on living plants and to some extent on animals, but we're kind of focusing on the plant interactions here. The hyphothallus. So, and again, my apologies to my students who have heard this a million times. Um, we're heterotrophic, and fungi are too. We are animals, complex three-dimensional vertebrates, and when you consume food, putting in your alimentary canal, and you digest it down inside there, but actually inside your digestive tract, it's still outside of your body. It's a tube, basically. It's a complex tube, but it's a tube. And you flood enzymes and other compounds onto food and break down smaller particles and then absorb those small food molecules across the membranes of your small intestine. Fungi uh, are feeding on external sources also, but they don't have this three-dimensional organization and alimentary canal and lots of tissue differentiation. They simply have linear filaments of hyphae, and that's the extent of their feeding body or thallus. So here's a line drawing of a single mushroom spore that's germinated into a dichotomously branching colony of hyphae. So you have to be in close contact, in actual physical contact with your food source if you're a fungus, so you can pour enzymes out onto it, break it down outside of your body, and then absorb the small molecules across the hyphal walls to achieve, uh, to get them in your cytoplasm for nutrients. Where's that? Okay, so I don't have a video of a fungus feeding, but I want to show you an animal down in the tropics that feeds sort of like a fungus. Let's just take a look at this. This is a tarantula, actually, and this is on YouTube, our favorite video source nowadays. This is a tarantula feeding on the remains of another tarantula. Why is this like a fungus? Well, because the spider is one of the few animals that actually captures its prey and injects, immobilizes it first and injects it with digestive enzymes to basically digest it first, either in a web or holding it in its palpi like this tarantula, and then sucks in the broken down food material as a liquid. So it's not exactly like a fungus, but it's a cool video, so. <laughs> Look at the juice right around the mouth parts. There was another one on the tree just down a little bit lower here, too. It wasn't feeding different species of tarantulas, so there were two fairly large tarantulas on this tree trunk that we just happened to come up upon in the forest during one of our expeditions. So that was that. So there are other feeding. 
got to get their food somewhere else and they have to have these high fulfillments to be in close physical contact to, to it, to their food source to digest it externally and then absorb. So within that context, now this kind of jumps back to the bigger picture. Most fungi are saprotrophs. They break down organic matter that's already dead for other reasons. That's a critical ecosystem function, not only in forest and terrestrial systems, but all terrestrial ecosystems. Mainly because the organic matter would build up. The terrestrial organic matter pool that is dead is one of the largest stored carbon reservoirs in terrestrial ecosystems. And that's the terrestrial carbon cycle on the left. We're ignoring the marine for the moment. Um, well, you couldn't have that dead organic matter building up indefinitely without it breaking down or we'd be quickly buried under enormous amounts of organic matter. So it's fungi and to a lesser extent bacteria that are involved in breaking that organic matter down and volatilizing some of the carbon that is mineralized to CO2 back to the atmosphere to complete the carbon cycle under its normal conditions. Those are saprotrophs couple local wood decaying saprotrophs on the left. You can be a fungus and interact with plants as a pathogen also. There's an armillaria mushroom coming up out of an old stump of a killed tree that was killed by it on the top right, and another root disease tree killer, Phalinus weary on a large Douglas fir log that is now tipped up due to root decay by the fungus while the tree was alive. So those are saprotrophs and pathogens, but they're also mutualists. Now there are other types of mycorrhizae than ectomycorrhizae, but we're going to focus on these because we're researching these in the, in the neotropical forest where they're very poorly known now. In this situation, the fungus, instead of obtaining its food from dead organic matter, substances or acting in a detrimental way to feed on living plants, it's actually intimately and physically associated with the living fine roots of the plant uh, to absorb carbon that is traded to the fungus by the host plant, which is photosynthetic, and in return exploring the root environment to take up water and minerals, part of which are partitioned to the plant in a mutual exchange of benefit. So here's some, several different types of ectomycorrhizae, roots enshrouded by fungi. This is a classic shot from a microcosm experiment, um, a little tiny lodgepole pine seedling in a soil containing pot with a plexiglass front inoculated with Swillus bovinus, which is a bolete mycorrhizal fungus. Most of what you see there in the soil are the mycorrhizal root tips on the two or three axes of the plant root system and a vast extension of fungal hyphae out into the soil. Uh, when a plant is in an ectomycorrhizal condition or any kind of mycorrhizae for that matter, the fungus actually gives it the capacity to explore an enormously larger three-dimensional volume of the soil microenvironment to obtain critical things like mineral nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, et cetera and transfer at least a portion of that yield from the soil into the plant to facilitate its overall growth. And in return, the plant is photosynthesizing and dumping quite a bit of its carbon gain into the hyphae. Look how little the pine seedling is. All the carbon that's in that fungus growth through the soil is derived from photosynthesis of that little seedling in this experimental setup. Well, ectomycorrhizae as a type of mycorrhiza, there are other fungi and other plant groups that do different types of mycorrhizae that function more or less the same way. The fungi that do ectomycorrhizae are in fungal groups, primarily basidiomycetes, but also ascomycetes that make macroscopic fruiting bodies, i.e. mushrooms that we see out in the field and we recognize as sort of the charismatic representations of fungal activity when we're out in nature. Here's a, just a slide showing some of those characteristic groups, the boletes, ammonida, the various chanterelles, a number of coral fungi, rushula, lactarius, etc. So keeping in mind the sort of 
basic ecological strategies. All fungi are heterotrophs, some are saprotrophic, some are pathogens in dealing with in a detrimental way to get their food from living plant material, and quite a number of mutualists in this mycorrhizal associations in terms of how they relate to obtaining their food. So let's take a look at how these functional attributes of fungi may indeed have the ability to affect macro scale on-site uh, composition and structure of forests. And let's look at the tropical example first. So what the heck's the Guiana Shield? We'll address that in a moment. And why are its forests peculiar? The ectomycorrhizal fungi, why are they important and why are, what are we doing about it? Sporocarps, mycelium, and diversity, why do they matter? And are the tropics impoverished in ectomycorrhizal fungi, which has been something that ecologists and mycologists traditionally have thought to be the case. We now know otherwise. So let's dive into this stuff. Here's a graphic of northern South America, including the majority of the Amazon basin, with the country boundaries outlined. So the Guiana Shield is a distinct geological region that is inside that white oval. And uh, the Guiana Highlands are an area of sandstone table mountains which cap the underlying igneous basement shield rock, which gives the overall shield its particular geological character. In this vast region, most of the Amazon basin, adjacent parts of Venezuela and the Guianas there, most of the landscape in its natural condition was closed canopy tropical rainforest with a few areas of natural grassland. Um, but the forest composition, you may be in a plane flying a transect from Georgetown, Guiana on the coast all the way down to Manaus in Brazil in the central Amazon. And you could fly, even today, the right plane transect and for 99% of that 2,000 plus miles, you would see unbroken forest canopy in all directions till you got near to Manaus. But if you get inside those forests and begin to look at the plant community composition, particularly the trees, there's a vast difference in what's going on in the Guianas compared to the central and upper Amazon basin itself. I'm going to skip the Smithsonian video that's there. So here's, here's a map or diagram essentially that's looking at a plot network of tree documentation really, tree diversity, woody plant diversity, trans-Amazonian and including the Guiana Shield region. This was a nature paper by Hanster Stege and a number of other colleagues. A couple of the dots up there in western Guyana are actually plots that I contributed to this data set. The way to look at this is if it's darker green on a per hectare basis, you have a higher number of woody plant species in those forests. So you can see a clear gradient. And in the upper Amazon over there in um, the lowlands of eastern Peru and Ecuador, you, you're looking at 100 to 199, 200 to 300 woody plant species per hectare. Hectare is 2.2 acres. And you can see that gradient diminishing a bit coming down the Amazon River Basin, but especially as you go up toward the northeast toward the Guianas. Lots of small dots. The size of the dots is relative to the alpha diversity of trees in measured plots. So there's a lot of reasons for this, we think. Part of it has to do with the unique geological and soil system in the Guiana Shield relative to the rest of the Amazon Basin, and also because it's considered to be a low dynamics environment. Um, environmental disturbances on a large scale are much weaker drivers of forest structure in the Guianas than they are in a lot of the Amazon basin for a, a number of different reasons. So some things turn up when you start looking at these Guianan forests closely. You get areas where individual tree species will dominate the tropical rainforest, a highly unusual situation. And trees tend to have overall higher seed mass and low dispersibility and a much higher propensity to be able to generate seedlings in the proximity of the parent tree. This is also weird for tropical forest. And there's a bunch of reasons based on host-specific seed and seedling predation that 
in most tropical rainforests of the world that are high tree diversity, plants don't do very well in terms of reproducing right in the vicinity of the parent tree. Their seeds only survive to seedlings and beyond when they're dispersed at a distance. And that tends to be not as pronounced in the Guianan forest in the neotropics. So there's Guyana, the country that has the, the um, little lavender circle in it. So low tree diversity overall. If you still get up in a plane and fly over, it looks like massive rainforest. But when you go in and mensurate stands inside, much lower diversity. So extremes in that situation were noted in western Guyana in the Pacaraima Mountains clear back in the 30s by Myers, who was a naturalist and also Paul Richards, an early uh, British ecologist that worked in British Guiana in the 50s. And during my work with the Smithsonian, we ran into these forests that were dominated by a particular legume tree, the Symbi, or several Desimbi species, in which you had what we call monodominant tropical forest, where literally the majority of canopy trees in a stand were of a single species. And, um, recruitment of seedlings and saplings were also of the same species. This doesn't sound that weird to us as temperate ecologists, uh, because we have low tree diversity in general, lots of dominance, but it's very unusual for the tropics as a whole. One of the main culprits here is the Symbi corambosa. There's a monster tree on the right, and I'll show you a little video of that in a second. There are lots of leguminous trees in the tropics. The family Favaceae, we have native ones up here. We grow a lot of them in agriculture to produce beans. But the little herbaceous climbing pea in your garden is an anomalous life form for the family Fabaceae because they're most diverse in the tropics. And in the tropics, they are very large trees and or large woody lianas, climbers. Symbi corambosa is one. It's unique for the neotropics because um, phylogenetic studies have nailed this down unequivocally. Its closest relatives are in West Africa, even though it exists in the Guiana Shield, the genus Desimbi. And they form extensive monodominant stands, and they're ectomycorrhizal, unlike most neotropical trees, which have a different mycorrhizal type with some different properties. So here's a video of this tree on the right, which is the biggest. Notice it doesn't really look like a real tree because it doesn't have a single trunk. It's reiterated. This tree is a clonally regenerating tree of indeterminate lifespan that continually sprouts up and replaces older parts of the tree with new shoots and maintains its site position in the field for an undetermined length of time. But this is the biggest Desimbi we've ever seen. And there's a bit of music to go along with this from Big Twist and the Mellow Fellows. Not a single part of this tree is part of the original biomass of the tree. It's grown on top of itself through multiple cycles with time. Oops, somebody gave him a cigarette. Those are adventitious roots hanging down there. Eating a handful of peanuts. This is up inside the circle of crown shoots looking down. Eating lunch. She came all the way to Singapore for this shoot. This 
This side is, of the tree is particularly impressive because of the amount of roots coming down, which is one way that the Symbi corymbosa reinforces this common, common trunk in this unusual reiter reiterative development. And what this what the hex has got to do with fungi? Well, we'll find out in a minute. Oh, Lord, how did I do that? I knew something was going to go wrong running the videos. I'm sorry. Okay, so one thing we did for quite a while was try to suss out what may, might be going on from a life history standpoint in these ectomycorrhizal trees that could lead them to achieve these extraordinary levels of dominance in a forested region where, where um, or in a biome of the world where dominance of forest by individual species of trees is not very common. So we wanted to document the degree of dominance, whether it's persistent, whether the trees are replacing themselves through time in the monodominant stands, and whether they're adaphically driven. And one thing we did was some remote sensing analysis of Landsat photographs to get a better handle, this very remote area, on what the proposed distribution of these dominant monodominant Desimi stands could be, and this is one of the images from our paper in Biotropica. Everything in green up there on the right uh, with about an 80 percent estimated accuracy level from analysis of Landsat photos is Desimi monodominance in about a 20 by 20 kilometer area of the upper Pitaro Basin. So we did a bunch of studies early on before we started digging into the fungal diversity associated with these trees and came up with basically an interplay between different life history traits, one of which is the ectomycorrhizal condition that could be interacting through space and time to help maintain dominance in these trees in these uh, stands in Guyana. Um, there's a series of graphs here, but up on the upper left is uh, in five different, cumulative in five hectares of the Symbi forest, the amount of cumulative basal area of the trunks of, of woody plants in, the, in those five hectares, uh, upper left there. Uh, you can see the Symbi corymbosa, swamps, all the other species that are ranked out to the right enormously in terms of basal area. You look to the right, this is diameter class of individual trees, upper right, um, in that same five hectares of forest, the black part of the bars being the Symbi corymbosa. Well, in the smallest size classes, it's not necessarily dominant. But if you go over to the right and get into the really big trees, they're almost exclusively 100 centimeters dBH and beyond and above two meters in DBH, they're almost all to Symbi corymbosa, and these are those huge reiterated trees which tend to fill up the majority of the above ground and below ground space in these stands and have the most influence on their structure. The bottom graphs are from three hectares of mixed forests that are lacking to Symbi in the area that show curves and diameter class and species rank and basal area that are typical when you go out and mensurate a mixed forest actually anywhere in the world, including the tropics. One of the mechanisms that Desimbi has to maintain its persistence on the stand is mass fruiting. This is a type of reproductive strategy in, in mostly woody plants where the species is not designed to reproduce at a constant rate by seed every year, but has a supraannual fruiting thing uh, going on where it produces massive amounts of seeds on a multi-year basis with low or no seed years in between. The Symbi does this in a big way. It massively reproduces. We thought on a five-year cycle, but now know that that's not as cut and dried, but it's very resource expensive. And this, we'll skip this slide anyhow. We know that, well, that um, El Nino-based events trigger this species to mass flower because drought is the teleconnected effect of El Ninos in Central and Northern South America. So that extended dry season that comes post strong El Nino in this region leads to a lot, much higher solar radiation over the dry season and that is thought to be the mechanism that entrains individuals of the species to flower synchronously which could lead ultimately to a massive amount of fruit set. We had one of these events in 98. We had another one in 2003. And those were both following fairly strong El Nino events. 
what we're trying to do is monitor this thing through the next masting cycle since 2003, and guess what? We've been down there every year in the field since 2003, and we haven't had another mast. It's been nine years now. We haven't had a strong El Nino either. So how does this relate to fungi? Well, in this masting cycle, which is the way that this species of tree dominates the recruitment pool of forest with its own progeny, seedlings and saplings, the mast is going to be resource expensive, and we documented this heavily in the paper. Lots of carbohydrates, lots of mineral nutrients to produce all that biomass of the fruits and flowers. That's going to create a drain on the plant. There's, there, there's a masting event. There's going to need to be a recovery period by the trees within which it gains back a carbohydrate threshold or positive balance in the tree, but also mineral nutrient uptake presumably by the facilitative effects of ectomycorrhizae, bringing the trees up to an internal carbohydrate mineral threshold so that they're ready when there is an El Nino event and a change in the climate, climate in a way that's going to entrain the members of the population region-wide to flower synchronously. You have to have that to actually yield an effective masting event. So this is a hypothesis, and we're waiting for that next mast year to get a capper on it to analyze the data between a, a full masting cycle between two masts. They also reiterate, and I showed the video, the, with shoots and adventitious roots ad infinitum to the point where we can't say, like a tree on the bottom right, even within an order of magnitude, how old it might be, 1,000 years, 2,000? It's hard to say. There's no measurable biomass that you could do any kind of dating on from the original tree. But if you have this kind of strategy, it could also contribute to the ability of individual trees, once they're established in the stand, to maintain site dominance over time. The, the weird thing about this, which is pretty much undocumented across tree species around the world, is that they not only vegetatively regenerate with reiteration, maintain site persistence of individuals, but they also mass fruit. So they reproduce sexually heavily on a supper annual basis to stock the recruitment pool with seedlings and saplings. So it's an extreme form of monodominance. So the fungi that are symbiotically involved could sit in the middle of this with this sort of hypothetical mechanism. Individual trees are persistent because of this reiteration capacity, the trapping of organic matter above ground in all the nooks and crannies of these big trees, and the resulting indeterminate lifespan. Uh, periodically recruiting by mast fruiting mechanisms, which are very expensive for the tree to do, but which will allow it to maintain a recruitment pool for the long term in terms of eventual restocking the stand when and if the big stand-dominating individual trees finally die. The mycorrhizae, based on their nutrient uptake capacities, could be driving this in a critical way. And this could be, lead to exclusion over time of tree species that don't have the capacity to form this type of mycorrhizae, which is not common in the tropical rainforest, ectomycorrhizae. So what we've been doing more intensively now is looking at the actual fungi that form the symbioses with these trees. So we've been looking at ectomycorrhizal fungal diversity, group of fungi, ecological assemblage of fungi that are not very well known from tropical forests in general, mainly because the areas that they occur are patchily distributed where you have representatives of a few lineages of plants that are tropical that do ectomycorrhizae. This type of mycorrhizae is very common in our area. Pine family and oak family plants, among others, which often dominate our temperate systems, have this type of mycorrhizae. Where well, they're important ecologically, why, why study them at all? The symbiosis, though, is, did not have a single origin. Among the basidiomycetes, there's been at least 16 origins in the fungi and phylogenetically independent groups of ectomycorrhizality in at least 16 different lineages of plants. And the resulting radiations, evolutionary radiations and speciations in both of the symbiotic groups have resulted thus. We've got about 7,000 species of ectomycorrhizal fung fungi described so far formally in about 250 genera out of about 50,000 formally described macrofungal species writ large that actually have names, 
But estimates are that total ectomycorrhizal fungal diversity may exceed 20,000 species, therefore the majority are undiscovered. And with fungi in general, when you go into the tropics, most things that you collect are new to science, and I'll show you some evidence for that in a minute. But we've, along with these ecological studies, we set up a hectare plot array system quite a while ago in 2000 in the upper Pataro Basin to go in and look at, um, through periodic rainy season sampling, try to start getting a handle on what the actual diversity in general of macroscopic fungi might actually be in two highly discordant forest types in close spatial proximity to each other in the landscape. The mixed forest that lacks the Symbi ectomycorrhizal trees completely and monodominant the Symbi forests. And you can see the green and yellow dots on the map there of our plot array, several kilometers separating the plots basically. Well, crunching down the, the data of morphologically distinct species, uh, you have to keep in mind the majority of these don't have formal names on them yet. We're up to about 850 or 860 different macrofungi. This includes sapotros, insect parasites, as well as ectomycorrhizal fungi between the two forest types. And a, a little more diversity in the sign before us, but that's largely because not because they have more sapotrophic fungi, but because essentially all the ectomycorrhizal fungi are restricted to those stand types in the local landscape. So crunching down just from the Desimbi plots, and this is repeated visit sampling over two month periods during the peak of the rainy season down here in these remote forests in Guyana, basically crawling on your hands and knees picking up and enumerating fruiting bodies of mushrooms in 10 by 10 meter grids in these hectare plots. Well, inside the plots, we're up to 107, 127 species of ECM fungi across 25 genera, 13 families, so with seven years of sampling. We missed one year between 2000 and 2008. Out of these 127 species, 68 are new to science uh, that we have formally described so far. 29 are previously described. They had names from other regions of the neotropics, and 30 require further study, which means we haven't gotten to working them up completely yet, but it's likely that the majority of those remaining 30 from the plots are going to be new to science. From our general collecting around the plot areas, another 46 additional off-plot species. Why is this important? We're up to like 174, 175 ectomycorrhizal fungal species in this ecosystem, which is very much comparable to diversity levels from these kinds of fruiting body samples that have been done in temperate and boreal forests that are dominated by Pinaceae or Phagaceae and not documented at this kind of diversity level anywhere else in the tropics so far. And that's partially because the studies haven't been done and partially because this is a very unique ectomycorrhizally rich type of tropical system. Many of our fungi have extremely unusual macromorphologies. Every single fungus in that plate on the right is very weird compared to the rest of the members that are in the genus that it's included in that have temperate relatives for ways I don't have time to get into, but trust me, they're really weird. So what happens when we look below ground? When you go out and collect mushrooms in a forest ecosystem, the mushroom is just the fruiting structure of the fungus. So it, it, whether you find them or not, whether you find a mushroom in a given area of forest, that means that fungal species is there. But if you don't find its fruiting body at a given collecting event, it doesn't mean the species is not there because they're existing primarily as mycelia below ground or in substrata feeding and they only fruit when they're ready to, and the fruiting bodies are usually transient. So one thing mycorrhizal ecologists are starting to do now is use molecular methods to go below ground and actually sample the mycelium of the fungi itself using DNA sequence markers to see if we can get paint a different picture or a more robust picture of diversity of different functional groups of fungi. So we've been doing this the last few years in some different stand types that have heavy representation of ectomycorrhizal trees in Guyana. In a recent study we got out in New Phytologist, we found stands that had two Desimbi species and yet another leguminous species, Aldina insignis, that is also ectomycorrhizal, occurring sympatrically in the same stands. 
taken together, co-dominating the stands. And what we started finding, and keep in mind, we've got a fruiting body-based database of 175 species. They're all sequenced. We've got a sequence library, species-specific regions like the ITS. So we can go in and sample the rootlets that are mycorrhizal in a systematic way, sequence those, and compare them to our fruiting body database to see which one match up at the species level and which ones don't match anything in our database. Nothing that we ever sequence matches anything that's on GenBank, so we don't even worry about that. We don't even get hits any higher than like 80% for the ITS on GenBank because the tropics just haven't been sampled enough. But the bottom line from this study was that in, in these Dysymbia and mixed co-dominant stands, we, we got 118 species from the below ground sampling, which is kind of comparable to the 120 fruiting bodies that we got nearby from the decorumbosa plots by sampling over 1,200 root tips and sequencing them. But basically 60% of the ITS sequences of those 1,200 root tips or 118 species did not match at the species level with known fruiting bodies from the very same ecosystem, which means there's a lot more unknown diversity there in this functional group of fungi than just collecting the mushrooms, even for many years, is going to tell you. So we've conservatively estimated that just locally we're up to 250, maybe 300 species of this functional group of fungi in the upper Potaro Basin. Conclusions, diverse ECM fungal assemblage representing most major lineages in Guyana. Most tax are new to science, also regional endemics and a few with broad tropical distributions. The alpha diversity in sites is on par with ECM diverse north temperate systems. Counters the old idea that for some reason when you go toward the tropics, ECM fungi become less diverse unlike most organisms, but our site certainly counters that idea. Significant diversity remains unrecovered as fruiting bodies or sporocarps. This does have some conservation implications. Fungi don't make it onto the radar screen that often when conservation decisions and planning are being made. There's reasons for that that have to do with the nature of fungi. Their phallic systems are cryptic. They're mycelia can't identify them directly from mycelium. You have to have fruiting bodies. Fruiting bodies are ephem ephemeral and stochastically appearing. It's hard to sample an area to see what you've got with any reasonable level of assuredness as compared to, say, plants or animals in a given system. In Guyana, and part of it has to do with they just haven't been studied as much. In Guyana, we know that western part, if you look up there on the left in the Pacaraima Mountains from a plant standpoint, is rich in endemic plants. And the known distribution of these Dysimbi host trees is essentially right in the same area where overall plant endemism is high. But in Guyana, it's one of the most undisturbed tropical parts of the world, but most of it's de facto wilderness still. They have essentially almost zero protected area system. They're still wild and fully intact with their biodiversity because they haven't been exploited yet, essentially. And a lot of the regions are unroded and inaccessible still, unroded. So most is de facto wilderness. If you've got high endemism in the Pacarima Mountains and you've got what is the highest hot spot for ectomycorrhizal fungi, at least smack dab in the middle of it, this kind of information could potentially be woven into potential plants for protected areas in the region. But this is still an early work in progress. But we do provide all the information that we have, along with the Smithsonian's biodiversity program in Guyana, to various agencies and so forth in Guyana so they at least know what we're finding in case they get around to the point where they're going to start drawing some lines on places and maps and making them protected areas. So let's move to the temperate part and wrap up. This will be a little shorter. So how can fun fungi shape structure forest? How can pathogenic or decay fungi, not mycorrhizal fungi, possibly do this? Let's look at a case study on selective pathogen attack in old growth dug fir white fir forest right up here in the northern California coast ranges. <clears throat> so this is a summary of a project that I'll describe in a minute, but I, I like to use this slide. This is an aerial flyover by plane in a 
uh, Montane coniferous systems in Montana showing these things look like alien crop circles on the landscape. These are gigantic long-lived disease centers of our malaria root disease that have been spreading radially in the forest from tree to tree for many centuries and leaving an imprint on a macro scale that you can see actually from a plane when you fly over. There's things going on inside those circles there that are radically changing the composition of the tree community there and the other aspects of the ecology by accelerating gap formation and light penetrating to the forest floor and removing susceptible tree species to these native pathogens. So Ashley Hawkins, who's up there on the right, and he's not cutting a tree down. That's a special tool called a Pulaski, which firefighters use, but forest pathologists especially use them to dig into rotten wood to see what it looks like. And that's his father, Wayne. I actually did his master's study up here on Horse Mountain inland in the, the Doug Fir White Fir Forest, and there are some nice late cereal stands that the Forest Service maintains up there off Titlow Hill Road. So I'm going to summarize Ashley's study and see what we perceive to be fairly profound effects on native forest pathogenic fungi on one of two co-dominant tree species in this system. So there's a couple of pathogens that are main players here. Our malaria root disease. These are agaric mushrooms, but they are tree attackers and potentially tree killers that spread by these black rhizomorphs in the soil system and move from one infected tree that they've killed and begin to gain resources from the wood biomass outward to potentially attack the root systems of an adjacent susceptible tree and move into it. They produce a mushroom type fruiting body. So our malaria is going to be a player here, as well as Pseudoinonotus dryadius, which does a root and butt disease of conifers, particularly white fir in our area. And it makes a conch-like fruiting body exhibited up there to the right, the base of white fir, and down on the lower left. That's Dr. David Largent, my predecessor here, and leading to these sort of root ball tip-up tree falls that happen to the trees when the root systems are excessively decayed by the pathogen. So up there on Horse Mountain, there's some beautiful stands that are in the Six Rivers National Forest that are late cereal, if not old growth, Douglas fir and white fir, um, co-dominant in these stands and fairly big trees um, in both species, although the Doug firs tend to be bigger, and we'll see reasons why in a moment. What we were trying to look at, because the ecological context here in these types of mixed coniferous forests is Different tree species will have different degrees of tolerance of shade when they're in the seedling state. And forest succession in Douglas fir white fir stands in the absence of catastrophic fire tends to lead to initial dominance of stands by Doug fir, which may persist for many centuries, but ultimately an incursion or a gradation of white fir because it's much more shade tolerant in the system. And the white fir, if this plays out to its final state, uh, tends to become more and more dominant in the stand. Uh, fire usually sets this thing back before the white fir becomes exceedingly dominant, but fire suppression in the west has led to a lot more ingress of white fir in many forests uh, than it probably had during the days when the fire return intervals were much uh, closer to each other in time. So Ashley mensurated uh, about five hectares of these old growth stands up there for all pathogen occurrence. I don't have time to go into the details of how he did it. But we noticed in our forest pathology classes over the year that the, there was lots of wind throw in the white fir and very little in the dug fir, just observational evidence. We wanted to see if, and most of those were related to decayed roots leading to tip-ups of these trees, not just sheer mechanical failure. Uh, so we wanted to get some data to see if there was indeed what appeared to be selective root pathogen attack on one of the two dominant species and what the ecological consequences might be. So there's an armillary induced wind throw of white fir, rotten roots breaking off right at the ground level. We know it was armillary induced because the type of wood decay in the root systems and the, the presence of those rhizomorphs under the bark indicates that it was armillary action. 
Here's a pseudoinonotus dryadius, an old wind throw showing the really shredded, stringy rot from the decayed root systems of uh, pseudoinonotus dryadius, root decayed white fur in the same system. So what I actually did was a massive amount of mensuration and interpretation of symptoms, signs of living dead trees in about five hectares of this forest type up there on Horse Mountain, just a couple of tables to show uh, in various ways how white fur is getting preferentially nailed by these root pathogens. So if you look in the top box there are malaria, ABCO is white fur, and PSME is Douglas fur. So standing snags, logs on the ground had high evidence of R. malaria, and some of those trees had high evidence of both R. malaria and pseudoinonotus dryadius in white fir, and very little or none in Douglas fir and snags and logs. Standing dead trees that were dead but still standing fairly recently, excavations and examinations of the, the rot in the base of the trees showed that white fir was almost universally hit by especially the R. malaria pseudoinonotus combination, and Doug fur was not. Now, there are other pathogens acting up there, dwarf mistletoes, et cetera, but we're focusing on these two root pathogens. Those which we had evidence for only the action of pseudoidenotus dryadius were strictly on white fur. Just overall percentage of the different pathogen groups on white fur versus Doug fur, uh, Arsothobium or the dwarf mistletoes, they were about equally present as evidenced by witches' brooms and the canopy on both those trees. Our malaria was much more skewed to white fur. It's a root disease fungus. And you can drop down to pseudoinonotus dryadius, which was strictly on white fur. And they sometimes occurred in combination. This leads, of course, to when the roots are heavily decayed in these large trees, they're much more prone to wind throw. Wind throw results in canopy gaps in areas in the forest where light penetration is coming in and potentially changing what goes on in terms of plant recruitment and success in the light gaps versus the shaded areas of the forest. So we did a bunch of sampling of seedlings, both within canopy gaps that resulted from wind throw and also in closed canopy areas of the forest that were much more shaded. So this was kind of the kicker. This canopy gap are those two dots on the left with the arrow, arrow bars. White fir is the diamond shaped and Doug fir is the black line. Well, both of those trees were exhibiting significant, or uh, for the species, good recruitment in the light gaps. Even though those error bars don't overlap, they weren't significantly different between. But in the closed canopy situation, uh, although white fir, uh, seedling abundance overall in closed canopy situations was low for both species, but the white fir was significantly higher than the dug fir. The dug fir does not do very well at all with successful seedling establishment in the shade. So what does this mean? The pathogens are selectively impacting at a much higher level the white fir. The white fir is the late successional species in the stand that theoretically will eventually take over the stand in the absence of catastrophic fire. And it's providing, the gaps are therefore providing, though, a safe site for recruitment of Douglas fir in the stand, sort of mimicking what fire normally does in these stands also by opening up the stand in those light drenched ground level areas is where Douglas fir recruits really well post fire. So one of Ashley's conclusive state, conclusion statements in his paper was with continued fire suppression, shade intolerant species would be replaced by shade tolerant species over time. Pathogen activity may approximate the role of fire by selectively removing white fur and enhancing dug fur regeneration. Present study has demonstrated the importance of native, native pathogens in determining the structure and composition of western white fur Douglas fir forests through a shift in their successional trajectories. So the bottom line appears that in this case, the sort of end game of forest succession in the absence of catastrophic fire setting it back is being mimicked, is being short-circuited by the selective acti activities of the pathogens on the late successional tree species. We thought this was really cool. Uh, this is not the only study that has shown major impacts of native forest pathogens on forest structure and even su succession, but it's, it's a good example of this stuff going on in our area. 
the problem with forest pathogens in general are the introduced ones. Everything that I talked about prior to this slide, the local stuff, these are native organisms that have co-evolved in these ecosystems for a long time. Their activity may be being altered by things like climate change and warming in ways that we don't understand, but they're part of nature's plan out there. But when you start bringing in things from other continents that co-evolved with relatives of our native plants but not the exact species of our native plants, that's when we start getting problems. Similar ways, but the levels of resistance and spread of the pathogen can be much more heavy. And we have two very important examples in California right now, sudden oak disease, Phytophthora remorum, and Port Orford cedar root rot, which is also a Phytophthora. These are not even fungi, they're oomycetes, and they have swimming zoospores and sp dispersible sporangia that in various ways have been introduced from Eurasia and are now spreading through related tree groups like certain oaks or cedars in the case of Port Orford cedar from origins in Eurasia where they co-evolved with members, plant members of those same families and genera but not the same exact species. So this is a huge issue but native pathogens have their role to play in a way that's been going on for a long time because of these co-evolutionary processes. So one thing we're doing now just to continue this idea of well, what, how are fungi really affecting our local ecosystems structurally and, and so forth is, and this is the work of Nikos Nigerian. That's another picture of Ashley Hawkins, of course. He's up on a, way up on a Douglas fir that has a Fomitopsis officinalis conch on it, about 40 feet up the trunk. And we're looking, these are heart rot fungi, which act, which act on the heartwood of trees while they're still alive and actually have no direct pathogenic effect on the living sapwood, but they, they can with time structurally weaken the tree trunk by decaying the heartwood and lead to premature snapping or breakage, what we call top snap, somewhere high up on the tree. You get a top snap, you got a gap. So we're basically looking at the incidence of heart rot fungi in the mature trees and how that relates to top snap formation and the subsequent ecological cascade of gap formation and plant community composition change in the gaps by a process that's facilitated by a different ecological group of um, specialized e ecological group, the heart rot fungi. So I ran it right up to about an hour, so I'm going to go ahead and stop. I'm that's Nikos Nigerian, though. He is currently running this study on top snap phenomena up in Horse Mountain, and that is a very big Douglas fir that was probably 500 to 400 years old, maybe, that had Faola schweinitzii butt rot, and it snapped off prematurely, and you can see the cubicle brown rot in its decay column there, and it made a very big light gap in the forest. So I'm done. <laughs> I guess we can do some questions. If so, you are supposed to go to the microphone. Yeah. So you're talking about the implication of change in the forest structure slowly um, through yeah. these fungi and the like? Yeah. With these light gaps? What, uh, should we be alarmed with anything since it is over such a slower pace? Or are we concerned with how we're affecting that? Well, I would respond to that by first looking at uh, addressing the native versus introduced issue with the pathogens. I think on both levels we should be concerned about it, partially because there's emerging evidence that native plant pathogens may be behaving in different ways now relative to climate change, particularly warming. You mean they're accelerated? Or? Potentially accelerated in local and regional areas in terms of their overall activity. But there's checks and balances to a certain extent on how native pathogens interact with the plants they've co-evolved with. Introduced pathogens we need to be really worried about. And sudden oak disease is a good example because it's introduced species. There are certain members of the oak family, including tan oak, which are particularly susceptible from a mortality standpoint 
when they're exposed to this organism. And there are plenty of areas in coastal California where the mortality of tan oak has come on in an area and accelerated really rapidly to the point where the tan oak composition of fairly large local and sub-regional stands, uh, the tan oaks have declined and had mass mortality. That changes the ecosystem drastically by doing the same kind of thing, opening, opening up lots of canopy gaps but way faster than they would happen naturally and also, um, uh, with tan oak at least, selectively removing a very important native species from the forest community by acting so rapidly. Do we see like a change in the mycorrhizal structure or species diversification in the soils with the loss of these larger creatures? We don't know enough about that yet, but it is indeed a concern. Um, again, going back to tan oak, lithocarpus, which is an endemic to the California coast and, and adjacent parts of southwest Oregon. Uh, tan oak, in the, in the outer limits of its range, sometimes is the only ectomycorrhizal tree in the stand, particularly when you get down south of the Bay Area on the coast, towards Santa Cruz and some areas down in there. Um, there's wholesale removal of that species from the stand, which means its uh, symbiotic fungi are going to be disappearing from the stand, too. But we don't know enough about the implications of, what, of the removal of a species from an ecosystem, what it's doing to its, what it's really going to do to its below ground symbionts. But it's an important consideration. Thank you very much. Yeah. Are we done? Anybody else? Well, it's still sunny outside, so. Thank you.